Now, ladies and gentlemen, my privilege to present to you the one and only fabulous John King. Good morning, Peter. What's happening? Boy, I'm tired today. I don't know. I want to go out and play. <sighs> Spent yesterday shoveling sand into a sandbox that my kids haven't found yet. Aha! Uh-huh. Aha! Uh-huh. So that'll be fun. Yeah, you bet. Yeah, good. especially when they track it inside. And... Oh yeah. Well, it's at Grandma and Grandpa's house. <laughs> <laughs> Very clever. Very Genius. clever. You, you fiendish man. I'm tenting my fingers. <laughs> okay, anyway. But uh, yeah, so. You and I were having an interesting discussion. Yeah, so we were talking before the show about how you deal with people close to you, right? That yeah. that might have a political engagement that you just find vehement or disagree with, uh-huh. you know, right? Yeah. Uh, and the clip that I have for you that I want to play for you, this is a group of uh, very progressive uh, young people on a show called The Young Turks. They're all out for Bernie, okay? Okay. And this conversation popped up uh, when it came to dealing with Hillary voters. If you go ahead and cl- play the clip, that'd be great. What, what is it called? Can, here. Can you respect the Hillary there you supporter? Go. Okay, yeah. there you go. Okay, Young Turks, I got it. Okay. All right, it takes me a minute. To, okay, here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, the Young Turks. I have a hard time not disliking friends of mine who support Hillary. And wow. I know I know that that's a, I know that that's not a nice thing to say and I really don't care, right? Because, wow. Because my political views represent the core of who I am, right? And so if you support Hillary and you think she's a better candidate, at least explain to me why, right? Explain to me in detail why you believe her policies are more progressive than Bernie's. Explain to me why you think her voting record is better than Bernie's. Explain to me why she would represent you as a working class millennial, okay, who has so much student loan debt you don't know what to do with your life. Explain to me why she would be a better candidate for you. Please, yeah. please do it. No, right? no, and but, they can't but I, do it. I, I totally disagree with you, Anna, and I'll tell you why. <laughs> Not because you're wrong on the policy, you're obviously massively right on the policy, but because they just don't know politics. No, no, no. But here's, they just don't know it. Okay, this is what I do for my career. Okay, mm-hmm. this is what I live for. So it's not like I'm reading some headlines and I'm like, hey, I want to engage in some political discourse. No. So yeah. I sit down and I explain to them in so many different ways. I had conversations about Hillary Clinton's support of private prisons, Hillary Clinton's support of for-profit colleges, Hillary's support of ridiculous foreign policy that has only perpetuated more war. Detailed explanations for why she is not a good progressive candidate yeah. and they reject that evidence and so how is it possible for me to respect them after that no no i'll tell you a couple of reasons why. i need to hear this too because i feel exactly the same way <laughs> you feel the same it's way. very hard when people dismiss logic and uh, that that you now you still have to re- retain respect for them there you go okay i i have the answer right here well, what's the answer this, this is actually from salon magazine okay which is you know really also hip, lefty really hip baby you know what i mean Okay. It anyway, tells me that is not their soundtrack. I'm sorry. I know. I I, I, I apologize. I'm, I'm I'm going back to my bebop roots. But anyway, uh, this this gentleman is trying to explain what's with the Hillary cult, mm-hmm. and he says, and I quote: "This is directly out of Salon magazine." And I quote: "I'm starting to wonder, given the increasing dysfunction of our democratic institutions, if the Hillary cult isn't perhaps registering an atavistic longing for a monarchy." Or perhaps it's just a neo-pagan reversion to idolatry, as can be felt in the Little Italy Street Festival in the scene of The Godfather, where devout pedestrians pin money to the statue of San Rocco as it's carried by in procession. There was a strange analogy to that last week, when Sanders supporters satirically showered Hillary's motorcade with dollar bills (laughs) as she arrived at George Clooney's uh, fundraiser. Which apparently is very sexist, just so you know. What do you mean? The throwing the dollar bills at the... Why? uh, I don't know. Ask the Hillary campaign. What, what, why would it be sexist? Well, apparently <laughs> when you George, throw dollar bills at women, it signifies well, something. Well, of course, because there's a man on the dollar bill. We're changing that, though. Oh, I have a clip about that, too. We are changing that, though. There's never going to be any more men. There's a shame with men. Men are bad. No, so, no. There's only The only man that's being replaced is... Uh, is um, Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson, right. Yeah. The, there's going to be two other women that have come onto the bills, right, but, but they're going to be on the flip side. On the <laughs> On the flip side. On the flip side. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, 
Uh, well, what did you think about that uh, well, Harriet Tubman I, I, announcement? Well, well, the, the Harriet Tubman announcement. I, I think she, she was she was a wonderful. I, I think they should have chosen Jeanette Rankin. Really? Yeah. So we had this debate before it happened, right? And if you recall, I supported Tubman, right? And I'm I'm actually really happy they got rid of a Democrat slave owner, right? And put a gun-toting African American <laughs> Republican on. <laughs> Seriously, like half of the show photos are the you know the old etchings of her right, and stuff. Right. She's there with her big old rifle. Uh-huh. She's awesome. You know, the other thing too, the Democrats are Do, having such a hard time running from this path. You, you know, when we have uh, <laughs> Republicans have their like Lincoln Reagan dinners. Right, right, right. Well, Jackson is usually the name of the dinners. You know, it's like the, the, the Jackson the, Kennedy the, the, dinner. They call the, Je- the Jefferson Jackson dinner. Yeah, Jefferson Jackson called. dinner. Yeah, so. Well, and and now uh, they, they've got a gun-toting female on the $20 bill soon. Republican. So. Republican, yeah. So I'm wondering if they really realized that when they chose her. Anyway. But anyway, one of the discussions you and I were having is that there are two people, and I guess I've, I've been in this business a long time, okay? And there are two people's voices, because we deal in... Audio here. There are two people's voices that I simply cannot abide to listen to. By the way, if you've ever listened to this show, I, I probably have, despite her being a front runner. Yeah. Uh, maybe just one Hillary cut every two or three weeks because right. it, you can see it's like Peter's chewing on tinfoil <laughs> and he's got a mouthful of fillings. Uh, there's just something about her voice, something about her delivery. I realize she's probably going to be our next president. I realize and I that. I don't too. know how I'm going to handle that professionally, okay, and try to maintain a, 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 a you know, here's President Hillary Clinton. I just do local and, news. And the I other, just do local and news. the other person, believe it or not, is Glenn Beck. <laughs> that you have a hard time listening to. Glenn Beck to me has become the chicken little of the airwaves. When you have you ever watched Blaze TV? I don't have it. Well, what, what, when you watch Blaze TV, he's he, he's become the ultimate, uh, um, uh, you know, a pitch man for the end of the world. I mean, you got to get this generator. You got to buy this food. You got to get this gold. You got to get this silver because it's all coming down. You know, and I'm going, come on. At the, Art Bell did that. Remember Y two K? Didn't work out very very well for him either. Anyway, well, all right. The so, year two thousand happened. There just wasn't a giant glitch yeah, that destroyed I know. it. So, so anyway, that 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 that's that's just me. Okay, it's just a personal idiosyncrasy or idiot syncrasy uh, <laughs> with me. I I don't know about you guys. If if you have the same sort of problem, a lot of people have that problem with Donald Trump. I do. So <laughs> exactly. There I, you go. See. I mean, I've really had to. You no. Know, so the lady that was talking earlier, she was. Right. Th- she talked about how you know my politics is the center of who I am. Right. Yeah. And I can't really. I have a hard time being friends with someone that doesn't agree with me. <laughs> that lady sounds like she's a hard person to be friends. Yeah. I have friends that are all over the political spectrum. Okay. But- Phones are ringing, so we're we're going to take a break, and uh, I'm probably going to get slapped around really good. So seven two one twelve ninety is our number. Remember, it's just a personal opinion. Okay. We're coming right back. The buying or selling of a home starts with the title. Making sure you have cleared title to your property is their specialty at Title Services Incorporated. Clint Romney and his staff at Title Services will put their training and expertise to work for you to make sure your transaction goes smoothly right down to the closing. Service is their middle name at Title Services Incorporated next to Rose Hours in the Langley Building in Missoula and also on River Street in Superior, next to the courthouse. Ow! Oh, yeah! All right, 721-1290 is the number. That's uh, John King over there. So, anyway, what? as we were, we were talking before the break, uh, yes. you know, having to deal with the, the, the realities of life that political candidates that I very much dislike on right. both sides of the aisle oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. are probably going to go head-to-head in the, in the final bout, and Hillary will probably end up being victorious, and... Peter and I will get to listen to her for the next eight years, or at least four. At least four years, yeah. Yeah, it's right. usually eight. Well, <laughs> let's let's see. If we, uh, Steve, can you help us out here? What's going on? Well, actually, I was just, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm agreeing with everything that you guys are saying, but, but what prompted my phone call was just to kind of call in and say, you know, Peter, I've never had more respect for you than I do right now. Uh-oh. Because, 
um, you know, the, the fact that you're outspoken in that respect, as well as um, I just can't stand to listen to Hillary Clinton either talk. Uh, Glenn Beck is the same way. You know, you speak of the doom and gloom, but that's all you hear out of Beck anymore is doom and gloom and, right, right. you know, whatever. And, and he, 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 he's really more or less the same he, way anymore. He, he, he's, he's, the, he's the ultimate pitch man of the apocalypse. Oh, you just spoke my language there, that the Hannity thing. I cannot turn on Hannity. Uh, it's like listening. What, what do you What do you mean, John? You mean well, don't like Hillary? His whiny every, voice? every day is a <laughs> a, a defensive Trump. <laughs> Absolutely, it's the same thing every day, yeah, and yeah. he doesn't let somebody finish a a coherent thought, what do you much mean? less <laughs> anything else. So I, I don't know. Anyway, I just wanted to put that out there. Thanks, guys. For All right, thanks, thanks for the call, man. Appreciate it. All right, we're uh, you guys think this is hard. You don't have to work in a radio station. You you could just turn off the radio, That's right. go back to trimming your lawn or That's whatever right. you were doing. Oh, yeah. yeah, <sighs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. I, I'll, let me tell you, before we get to Pete's call, years and years ago, <laughs> okay, this is back in the 90s when, yeah. when Bill Clinton was president, all right? I, I worked with a gentleman who would not do a story or anything that involved the word Clinton. He wouldn't read a story. He wouldn't do a report on a story. If it if involved the word Clinton, he would not do it. He would give it to me. What's that town if you're driving, you know, just past Bonner and Milltown, you keep going? Uh, yeah, it's, <laughs> it, it, it's that town just past Bonner. Seatown. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get Pete on the line. Good morning, Pete. Uh, uh, good morning. I was listening to your newscast this morning about the lady from the... Uh, Long association. Oh yeah, d- d- didn't you love that story? As 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 uh, as uh, fair and balanced as it wasn't. Yeah, uh, yeah. Not once have I seen the Lung Association hold that period of timber sale was to get out the dead and dying trees. Exactly. Not and, once and, have I seen them complain when our valleys filled with smoke while the United States Forest Service has a let burn policy going in the Magruder corridor. Yeah, uh, they're just absent, missing. Yep, that's exactly right, and and I'm going to be pursuing the, those avenues to uh, to do a a story in response to that uh, in the next couple of days. So I appreciate Uh-oh. you bringing that to bringing that to light. Uh, thanks. Thanks for the call. All right, seven two one twelve ninety is our number one eight hundred five six eight five three zero nine. So anyway, um, uh, I I don't know about you guys in in radio, we deal pretty much with audio. Okay, and uh, you, you hear my voice, you hear John's voice, you hear the voices of all the people that we have on the show. Whether it, and of course, when we're not here, there's Rush Limbaugh, and then there's Sean Hannity and Glenn Beck. And quick, quick update: uh, yeah. the Highway 93 is now clear. Oh, th- wonderful! Thank you. Yeah, there was a, there was a pretty bad accident there uh, between the peak and I believe uh, and Buckhouse Bridge is one of those people following too closely, kind of a chain reaction type deal. So. But hopefully uh, everybody's okay and they've cleared the area. All right, so uh, traffic is moving normally now. All right, uh, Tyler, you're on Talkback. Hi. So I missed that. Was there a crash down in Bilolo? Let me guess. Bilolo? Yes, Bilolo. Shocking. You want to know why? I'll tell you why. Every time when I go into Missoula, there's a 45-mile-an-hour uh, a 45 mile an hour speed limit zone right now going into town. And every time I hit 45 and go around that corner and go all the way into Blue Mountain at 45 miles an hour, Everybody passes me at like sixty five, like I'm like standing still yep. seventy. They don't. They, it's like they don't even realize that there, there really is construction going on. It's crazy. Well, like, I thought about driving down the middle of the road at forty five, trying to stop traffic for you for know, a, for a while. For a while, when they first instituted that, there was actually a sheriff's deputy at each end. Uh, I saw one yesterday, just sitting there, okay. just waiting. Yeah, yeah, I saw one. Uh, so uh, I, I just heard the caller um, right before me call in talking about how they've just, like, fed up with Hannity, and I came in, like, ten minutes late today. Sorry, I apologize. That's all right, Emmett. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Emmett! Wait, he won't be up for another yeah. <laughs> That joke is lost on him. <laughs> Sorry. Not on me. Uh, okay, so um, I, I totally agree with the other caller. I, um, I'm a faithful listener during election seasons. I listen as long and as, um, uh, you know, reliably as possible. Uh, I've quit. I listen to talkback, and that's it. I go to music. Uh, I don't listen to music uh, normally um, during the year. Um, not election year. I, I talk show guy. You know, I bounce around all of the talk shows. Uh, 
Let but me ask you a question. A follow up question deeper. really quick, Tyler. So are, are you, do you feel that it happened this year for you because you were so invested in a candidate or just because you feel so dis, no, just so much well, despair? I'm not, I'm not invested at all. I, I'm, I'm not because Montana doesn't matter. Well, it might matter this year, but I was going to say, this is one of the years that actually might matter. Yeah, it might, it might actually matter this year, but it, it doesn't matter because by the time it gets to us, it, you know, it'll be dwindled down. It would be pretty easy just to make that final decision. You know, paying attention it isn't very hard. But listening to all the crap that comes out of these guys' mouth about, you know, a debate here and a news clip here and, you know, blurb here, and uh, it's just, you know, Hannity, every day, same thing. Beck, every day, same thing. Uh, I just can't take it anymore. So I turned on music. I found actually a new <laughs> music station. And, and you know what? I'm not the, even going to say the name. I'm no, not going to say the name. No, it's okay. The, the, the election's in November, man. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. It's not even July yet. We're just I'm getting done. started, baby. We oh. haven't even had the primary yet. I tried. I, you know, I watched every debate. <laughs> I haven't watched a debate in, I think, two debates now. I just, I can't do it anymore. Yeah. All I right. Just, I'm done. Thanks, Tyler. All right. Thanks. Take care, man. P- appreciate it. Thanks for listening to Talk Back. We appreciate it. 721-1290 is our number. Okay, we're going to take a quick break. Come right back. Hey, we're back on Talk Back, having way too much fun on this uh, our open phones. So let's get to our, our good friend, Catherine. Hi, Catherine. Good morning, Peter. What's up? This is for you. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? This is a question for you. What do you think of ESPN uh, uh, letting uh, Kurt Schilling go because he has politically incorrect opinions because on he, Because he had an opinion? Well, well, his opinion was on, what, trans yeah, he, bathrooms? He, he, he thought yeah. the, whole, the whole idea of, of, of having laws to do transgender bathrooms was ridiculous. Right. And but he got fired. Yeah, he got fired for that. But, but, he, but he has been very outspoken over a lot of things. That's kind of his stock and trade. And that's why they hired him in the first place, was it not? Because uh, he yeah. was, yeah. Clearly, yeah. as radio hosts, we're all for people being fired for being outspoken. That's that's <laughs> one of our uh, bailiwicks. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I just wanted to throw that out at Peter and see what he thought. Because well, he's I, 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 well you, you, you have to understand, and he's he's not a dummy. He's a smart guy. No, he's a yeah. He's, he's a, a smart Cy, guy. He did multiple Cy Young Award winner. You know, exactly. Uh, so, he has a large following. <laughs> is, is that an IQ test? I haven't heard about. <laughs> What? The Cy Young Award. Cy Young, it's a baseball award. But you said he was a smart guy. I mean, the, the two just don't well, correlate. He's an intelligent athlete, okay? There, okay. A very gifted athlete. And, yeah. it, and, and he's a hard-nosed guy. And, yeah. uh, and he, he, when you're on the air on ESPN, stuff happens, and you, you, you say stuff all the time because it's sports talk. I mean, they, people talk all the time. That's what it's all about. Yeah, about that, sports, you, you you don't you don't have somebody just looking over your shoulder. Don't say that. Don't say that. I mean, it's, it's well, silly. now apparently yeah, you do. You say right? this, and you work under the FCC. Well, I mean, how many times have you pushed the wrong button and wanted to curse or something, and you couldn't because they're looking over your shoulder all the time? <laughs> and if you say it, you're you going to get fired. Well, let me let me tell you. Let me just real quick. We have a minute left in this segment, and I will tell you this is an honestly true story. I used to train young disc jockeys years ago. Mm-hmm. And they would come to me, and we would sit down and talk, and I would say, look, if you curse in your regular vocabulary at home and just around the job or whatever, you will say something on the air because something will happen, and, and uh, it, it'll, it'll just be an unguarded moment, and boop, out, it'll, out it'll come, and you will not be able to take it back. It doesn't work that way on live radio. So my advice to you is to train yourself not to curse at all in normal conversation so that when something happens, something comes up, you won't do it on the air. That is an absolutely true story. You know what is also absolutely true? Peter gave up on training anybody after that. <laughs> there, was, there, was, there was zip nada when it came to a and John they went, the They went, the heck you say? Anyway, like, hey, <laughs> yeah, Catherine, we're up against a break. Thanks. All right. All right. Our good, good <laughs> friend, Mr. Thane, is with us to save us from this nonsense. We're going to come right back. He's just shaking his head. He's not working for me, I'll tell you that. Okay, we're coming right back with, uh, with, with Mark Thane. Stay with us. All right. Uh, every month we have we have individuals that, that come and visit with us, and we are thrilled and honored to have Mr. Mark Thane. He is the superintendent of School District 1. Welcome, sir. Good morning. It's great to be back. And you should see, he's, he's, he's blinding me. He's got, he's got the blue shirt and the beautiful uh, uh, 
Is that a coral-colored tie? I think it's more orange. I don't know. <laughs> Whatever. We're in Montana. Going, There's there no coral going. here. <laughs> it's springtime. <laughs> it's sunset orange. Yes. Anyway. Um, yeah, so we have the phone lines open. If you have a question for uh, Missoula County Public School District 1, uh, Superintendent Mark Thane, give us a call, 721-1290. I have a question for you. So uh, my daughter, of uh, she's a Cold Springs attendee, and I, I guess they're preparing for the Smarter Balance tests coming up, right? That's correct. We're and, actually in the middle of the testing window. And, and uh, you know, I was, I was kind of surprised. Like, they haven't really ever taught my daughter typing, but all the test has to be done on computer. Tell, uh, tell us a little bit about how that came about. <laughs> well, that is an interesting question. And uh, there are some studies actually being conducted out there right now uh, with regard to the impact that uh, paper pencil test versus uh, an online version of the test and whether or not those keyboarding skills are necessary for the test taking. Uh, when you do get uh, third graders, for example, there are questions about uh, appropriate typing techniques and whether or not their hands are developed enough exactly, and their like fingers to do regular keyboarding. But I think uh, you've indicated uh, real clearly something that we've struggled with, and that is uh, we need to make sure that we don't have anything that would be a hurdle or a roadblock to a student evidencing what he or she actually knows on the exam. And so we do afford, of course, our kids the opportunity to work in computer labs, but uh, we haven't done the formal keyboarding instruction with third graders. Do they have little tiny keyboard? Like I can buy a 22, <laughs> a rifle that my eight-year-old can shoot, right? But I can't find a keyboard small enough. I, I could have her practice on this little iPhone if I turn it sideways. But. Sure. Well, and actually, one of the questions we have is about the use of iPads, laptops, uh, you know, notes, those kinds of things in order to take the assessments. And again, it's very different than traditional keyboarding skills. Uh, so it is an interesting question. We will continue to monitor uh, those assessment results and see if we can determine uh, just exactly what our next right steps are with regard to uh, eliminating those barriers or hurdles. Is there or could there be an option to have it either taken online or, or have a paper and pencil test? Uh, we don't at this point. We do have some accommodations for students that have individual education well, plans, just special print education. It out. Just, but, just print it uh, out. I mean, but, uh, no. so, uh, but the way that, just so you know, the way that the test works, Peter, okay. I, it's, the questions you're given may change depending on how successful you answer prior oh, questions. Oh, I yeah, see. So it's, it's dynamic. A, it's okay. a living, living, breathing test, right? Wow. Yeah. So, so if kind of like the Constitution, <laughs> you know. So actually, I, John, you raise a great point. So the test design is really interesting because in an old standard application with a paper pencil test, uh, say the Iowa Test of Basic Skills or those that we might have taken as uh, youth, you would take the test, you'd get a score, but uh, the test wouldn't really tell you what you did or did not know with a high degree of certainty. It would just plot you against uh, the rest of the students that took the test. Whereas with the dynamic tests, if you miss something, it can give you some opportunities to demonstrate to what degree you actually understand that concept by giving you additional questions or altering the difficulty so that we can more clearly understand what students do know and are able to do and what they do not yet know. And so then it can inform our instructional practice. So that's the intent with these dynamic tests is to really uh, kind of drill down to specific skills and help the teachers understand areas that they need to emphasize. Now, now one more thing that I kind of wonder, I have never seen any results. You maybe have, but I, I don't think most of the public has seen what the results look like to the parents. So, you know... I, I'm I'm okay with testing as long as it helps me become a better parent or helps you become a better teacher. I like that attitude. But 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 if uh, if I don't get any in info back, like that, I, I just kind of feel like it was a waste of our time. So, uh, are we going to be able to see the results from this test? You will. Uh, there are two things. First of all, uh, two years we've done this testing. The first year it was done as a pilot with the state and. Uh, we didn't receive any disaggregated data down to the student level. So we didn't get that information. It was really an attempt to uh, test the testing conditions as much as anything else. Last year, there were a great number of technological difficulties across the country. And uh, the testing, uh, the validity of the final results was in question. So 
Uh, ordinarily, they were intended to be released the beginning of June. It was December before we got any data. Kids had already moved on to their next grade level. And uh, it, there were just a number of problems with uh, measured progress back in New Hampshire. This year, we anticipate, and so far, knock on wood, uh, the testing's come off without a hitch. So uh, if we follow the normal cycle, we should have those test results early summer. We'll do our work with it, and we'll uh, then be sending it out to all the parents in the fall. So is it something, when I look at it as a parent, whatever you're going to be sending us. Is it something that, um, you know, clues me into what's going on? Because I guess the dynamic nature of the test, uh, it sounds like it's searching for really specific, you know, w areas where the child may be missing out on a chunk of knowledge. Will that sort of thing be communicated to me? Like, hey, your kid doesn't know how to write B's the right uh, way or whatever. Well, uh, well, with the typing test, I hope they can write a B. <laughs> uh, at any rate, uh, it, that certainly would be our intent particularly with regard to the teachers, that this could, in essence, uh, help us identify where we might have relative strengths and weaknesses in our curriculum and are there areas we need to teach differently. I think that what you're referring to really is going to be incumbent upon us to be able to communicate clearly to the parents what the test data means. Uh, you'll see uh, where your child stacks up uh, in relation to uh, anticipated grade level outcomes, as well as to all the others who took the tests. So it'll, it'll be a yardstick for you, and it'll help you to understand relative strengths and weaknesses as long as we communicate to you how to utilize the information as it's uh, presented L to you in written form. Last question, and then I think we have a caller we need to get to. We need to take a break, too. So. Will, the, will you be able to tell me what percentile my child ranks? nationwide as opposed to and statewide and citywide and, and school-wide? I mean, we all that different levels? We should be able levels? to do that, yes. Wow. Cheese number one! Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> we're we're going to come right back. Jeannie, we're going to get your call on a moment. I just want, I'm going to give you plenty of time to uh, to make your points. We'll take a quick break. We have two lines open. And uh, Mark Thane joining us here in studio, superintendent of School District 1. A little uh, thematic music here for our <laughs> our superintendent of public instruction. A little teach your children here. Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young. See, so, yeah, I just want to let you know I can still talk in a song. I haven't done DJing since the 90s, but hey, you know, it just never dies. Okay, enough of that. Let's move on to the telephone. Jeannie, hi, you're on Talkback with uh, Mark Thane. How are you Good doing? Good morning, Jeannie. Uh, hi, yeah, I like that song, by the way. <laughs> but anyway, um, I have a two-pronged question, but I'll make a comment first. And um, on February 24th of this year, there was an article in the Missoulian regarding the International Baccalaureate Program. And the board had just approved yet another position for the IB program for which Trustee Lorenzen stated isn't financially sustainable. And I've been against IB since its inception at Hillgate. And um, if you read truth about ib.com. If you go to that website, you can read about IB. And um, according to that website, IB shouldn't be in any American public school. It's pretty controversial because it's associated with the United Nations and is a top member of UNESCO, So, um, which is a branch of the UN. So anyway, um, I'll get to my questions. I was wondering if Mark Thane had any figures on how much money we have spent on IB since its inception, I believe, in 2011. Well, yeah. You know, he, both he, through grants he, and... He's standing right here, so I'll go ahead and ask him. <laughs> well, I have one more question. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Um, yes, this is for you, Mark. Yeah, <laughs> Excuse <there> me. <laughs> okay. Anyway, um, also, um, I was wondering, I asked in a previous program uh, how much money uh, we are spending on busing. Um, you know, the school district. And uh, I think that all these programs that we're uh, implementing, implementing in our school district, uh, in addition to the busing, is um, eroding our budget, um, you know, that should go into basic neighborhood school. Okay. Hey, Jeannie, finances. I have a quick question Wait, for you. Thank you. Uh, well, oh. hold, hold on. Quick question okay. for you. Have you ever thought oh. of running for the school board? Um, because yes, because, because, because I, I know that you, you are deeply <laughs> interested in this topic, and I was thinking, my goodness, this is somebody who should be, you know, doing something about it. Yeah. Uh, no, I, um, I just can't do it for various reasons. Okay. Um, but, yes, I have asked people, um, I have had 
that people ask me that. And I um, I just, you know, my uh, thinking is that you really don't have to. I understand. Or to be interested. Okay, in I got you. Stuff. Well, listen, we're, we're going mean, to let Mark you know. answer those questions, okay? Okay. Thanks okay, for the call. Thank you. All right, there you go. Okay, so. All right, so first some questions with regard to IB. Uh, the position that uh, Jeannie referenced uh, from the February 24th board meeting. Real quick, because okay. other than the words uh, United okay, Nations okay, and UNESCO, many people may not know what IB even Perfect. stands for. Thank you for uh, reining me in there a little bit. Uh, IB stands for International Baccalaureate, and... The International Baccalaureate Program is actually a nationally recognized uh, rigorous program that uh, falls into three different categories. There's uh, what's most widely uh, known is the International Baccalaureate Diploma Program, which is intended for juniors and seniors in high school. And like the advanced placement programs, uh, students who complete the International Baccalaureate Diploma Program take tests at the end, and if they attain... uh, certain levels of competency they're generally awarded college credit for that so what, they enter what, college with advanced placement what sort of um so i did ap classes when i was in high school and i had credits for for example english or there was a right. chemistry option at, and so what what is the ib credits what are, what field are they? Uh, same kinds of things uh, you would get math credits for ib math study you would get credits for world language study uh you would get uh, history, social studies credits, those kinds of things. We have uh, an agreement with the University of Montana that those students who complete the International Baccalaureate program would uh, be able to enter the university with sophomore status and uh, could have guaranteed admission directly into the Global Leadership Initiative program at the university. So uh, there are articulated pathways. Uh, The real foundation of IB is that it's an inquiry-based thematic unit approach to most instruction. And the teachers that have participated in the training uh, have told us, regardless of whether or not they actually implement the IB program in their classrooms, that it's been some of the best high quality professional development they've had because of the emphasis in those two areas. So back to Jeannie's specific questions. Uh, The first, the February 24th board meeting, uh, Franklin School is in the early phases of initiating an international baccalaureate primary years program. And essentially what would happen in an elementary school like Franklin and what is currently happening at Lewis and Clark is the teachers at a grade level would identify the specific themes that they might uh, teach a unit about. And they would have specific units of inquiry. Uh, They would implement it through that model of teaching and learning. And uh, the students would move through those projects uh, implementing, you know, what we would consider to be many of the 21st century skills, uh, communication, collaboration, some uh, project-based group work, those kinds of things. It's just a different way of approaching instruction. Those students are still responsible to master the same learner outcomes and targets that everybody else in the district would. Uh, So, for example, going back to the high school diploma program, if we have identified uh, learner outcomes for Algebra II, for pre-calculus, calculus. calculus. If the students are in those higher level IB math classes, they still master those same learning targets and outcomes. It's just the approach to teaching it is different. The position that Jeannie referenced is actually a half-time position as an IB coordinator for Franklin School through the implementation process. We have uh, some half-time instructional coaches that work in each of our title buildings. They teach in a classroom half-time, and then they support other teachers in their instructional uh, development the other half of their time. This position at Franklin is basically the same thing. So it's not a model that's different than what we've done across the district. Um, we have a number of those half-time coaches, half-time teachers in place, teachers in place, excuse me. So uh, that's the position that would be added to Franklin School next year. All right. Well, and, no. then, and then you have the buses, right? Yeah. Well, actually, I got a, a couple other questions. She asked about how much has been spent on IB, and uh, I don't want to sound like I'm uh, in the middle of this political season dodging the question, but <laughs> uh, it's more complicated than just putting a single dollar figure on it. And so what I would say is this. If we as a district uh, complete a high school curriculum review in social studies, at the end of that uh, process of identifying the outcomes, we would say, okay, what materials do we need to purchase to support teaching this curriculum? So maybe it's American history and we might have 300 students who need materials. We would ordinarily go out and buy 300 sets of textbooks. Well, if we've got an IB program in place, instead of buying 300 sets of the same textbook, we might buy 200 that are going to be for the AP and the traditional 
classes. We might have the other 100 that we're purchasing that are IB. So we're using uh, revenue that would have been used to purchase curriculum materials uh, regardless of what approach is being implemented. Some of those materials are going to be the standard materials. Some are going to be the AP materials. Some are going to be the IB materials. So uh, segregating it out is a little bit more challenging. There are some significant startup costs for teacher training, and we've been very fortunate in that the uh, Dennis and Phyllis Washington Foundation has given us two successive grants in the amount of one and a half million dollars. So we're three million dollars into that grant process, and the teacher training that's occurred with regard to implementation of IB has been funded almost exclusively through those grant opportunities. When we come back, I'll we talk come about back, we'll talk about busing. And we do have Catherine on the line. We have two lines open for you if you'd like to give us a call this morning at uh, 721-1290 or 1-800-568-5309. We're coming right back. Okay, we're back on Talkback. Pow! That's uh, John King over there. I'm Peter Christian. And uh, Mark Thane joining us here in studio, the superintendent of School District 1. Now, busing, the amount of money you spend on busing. Sure, and very quickly, I would just say that uh, with regard to the special programs, uh, we have not implemented special busing. Okay. Uh, we do have buses that shuttle students among our three high schools and the Willard Alternative High School program uh, throughout the school day so that, for example, students in any of those facilities could attend classes at our BOAG program on South Avenue our uh, automotive technologies program at Sentinel, et cetera. So we do have an in-district shuttle that runs. Uh, Jeannie's question uh, said something to the effect of uh, how much are we spending on busing and that detracts from other program, et cetera. And actually, that's uh, not the case. Busing is outside of our general fund budget. We have a general fund budget that's within state established parameters. Busing is actually through a permissive levy, and it's a separate uh, budget. I, I say that, and I recognize that regardless of what budget it is, uh, it impacts the local taxpayers. Uh, so we do need to be thoughtful about how much busing we do uh, have. But again, uh, we have bused basically through our attendance areas to schools uh, historically throughout the district, and it has not increased because of these additional programs. Uh, I know John and I have talked a number of times about Cold Springs and the new Cold Springs site, and one of the things we've looked at with regard to the uh, facility is finding a location for Cold Springs that will allow greater walkability and bikeability for those students that uh, and, and currently any, reside in Linda Vista and are all bused any, to the Cold Springs. Any site. movement there yet? As to uh, actually, we have an option in our realtor's hands. He's negotiating with a property owner, and I'm hopeful that we'll get to some resolution fairly cool. quickly. All right. right. I'm Great. hoping the answer is zip lines. There you go, right down that <laughs> hill. <laughs> that, I mean, the gravity fed students. And then like going home. <laughs> Yeah, uh, you ski use, lifts or or uh, pneumatic <laughs> pneumatic pumps like they use at the bank. You know, it's there you go. There you go. Perfect. Okay, uh, so much for that, Catherine. You're on Talkback. Hi. Okay. Good morning. Um, there are many online curriculums, and this is kind of I don't know, maybe off the wall. But does the public school system allow or access alternative private curriculums? For example, the Khan Academy, which uh, a lot of people use and count that toward graduation credits if students do a dual public homeschool system. And how flexible are you uh, as a public school in accepting other methodologies to, uh, towards graduation? Also, do you allow students to challenge classes if they can advance uh, faster, if they know the course material? Those are all excellent questions, Catherine, and I'll, I hope that I caught all of them. First of all, with regard to online curriculum, uh, the state of Montana uh, legislatively funded uh, the Montana Digital Academy, and that Digital Academy has a number of courses in their course catalog, and we do allow students to access the Montana Digital Academy. That is for original course credit. We also utilize it for credit recovery. So if a student, for example, failed Algebra one. The solution in past years had been that they go back and sit in the seat for another year and do Algebra One. They now have an opportunity to do that online so that they can continue with their regular course progressions. Uh, we do have a number of students that uh, do utilize the Montana Digital Academy that way. There are also a number of other uh, schools around the country uh, that do utilize online learning. One that we see with a great deal of frequency in the Missoula area is BYU Online. And with regard to all credits, uh, when a student enters our district, 
whether it's from another high school or whether it uh, includes some online or some homeschool, uh, we do a credit review. We review that transcript. Um, if somebody's been part of a formal homeschool network, for example, that does use uh, materials in a defined curriculum, uh, we evaluate that and determine whether or not those credits are acceptable. And again, from most of those online programs, uh, we find that they are rigorous and that those credits are accepted. With regard to uh, private school students, we do have, uh, or homeschool students, we do have some students in uh, local private schools as well as some students who are homeschooled that do register through our high schools so that they can access the Montana Digital Academy and they complete that coursework. We transcript it and then they can do with it uh, what they please with regard to the pathway they've established for their child. Uh, when a student comes to us and does want to uh, enroll in our district and maybe they've been homeschooled or uh, online school, uh, we again would evaluate them, accept the transcripts, and they would continue on the re regular course of study. We had a situation last year, for example, where a student was uh, going with his family on a year-long mission trip and would not have access to regular education and we were able to help craft a plan so that they could access online learning and understand that when they transitioned back into Missoula, uh, we would accept those credits and we wouldn't miss a beat. So I think there's a fair amount of flexibility there. With regard to things like the Khan Academy, uh, the Khan Academy's intent largely is to augment instruction or teach particular skills or content, maybe in a way that's different from what was done in the classroom so that kids can evidence mastery. It's not a defined uh, course with scope and sequence, typically, that we would recognize as an online class. I think the last one of your questions uh, was whether or not we allow students to challenge content and essentially get credit for it based on that challenge basis. I tend to believe that we should be proficiency based. If a student comes in and, for example, uh, could uh, test out of sophomore geometry and show that they have mastery of those skills, I believe that we should be able to award credit. Unfortunately, that's not the way the system is built right now from the state. We are still tied to the old Carnegie units and seat time counts, but that's something that is being assessed statewide right now and the question being whether or not you need to have 180 hours in a seat in order to get a credit. And so uh, we'll continue to evaluate that, but all excellent questions and I think in this day and age we do need to be a little bit more flexible and nimble. Okay, thank you, Catherine. Okay, Appreciate Bye. the call. We're up against a break. All three lines open now, by the way. Mark Thane joining us here, superintendent of School District 1. Got a question. When we come back, I want to get an update on how the new school construction is going. Sure. Because I know that that's, uh, that's huge. We passed $158 million uh, uh, bond issue for both the elementary and, and high schools combined. And that construction, in some cases, is already underway, at least infrastructure-wise. So I want to talk about that when we come back. Should have. Hey, we're back on Talk Back. It's Thursday. We're talking school. All right, that's John King over there. I'm Peter Christian, Mark Thane, superintendent of School District 1. Quick update on, uh, on school construction. Uh, how's that going? Uh, it's uh, fast and furious right now. We actually have about 13 different projects, uh, either under development or preparing for construction. Uh, the two uh, I would characterize maybe as signature projects on the elementary side that are underway right now are the Franklin School and the Lowell School projects. Uh, not only have we had the architects and engineers engaged with the staff and community in development of those uh, design development documents, but uh, we have hired contractors in both. We're utilizing an alternative project delivery model. Uh, which means the contractors are working directly with the engineers and architects as designs are developed so that we can uh, understand immediately what the budget impacts of everything might be so that we it can just stay like it just makes on, sense, on yeah. budget. Yeah, it's a great yeah. project, and the state has that alternative uh, delivery method in statute, and it's really been helpful for us. Uh, we are working with uh, architects and engineers on a number of projects, uh, Paxson School, Rattlesnake School, Chief Charlo School. Um, there will be some work there this summer. We will do a heavy amount of technology work in both the elementary and the secondary district, uh, enhancing our fiber optic network and our uh, wireless networks around the district. Uh, we have some significant projects initiated at high school level. Sealy Swan High School, uh, we're preparing for some seismic work, again, some uh, remodel and then uh, some addition of uh, uh, an auditorium theater seismic space. Seismic work. Uh, you know, we had engineers assess all these buildings because they're of varying ages, and many of them uh, lacked 
uh, alignment with current needs with regard to earthquake uh, tolerance. And so we're doing some structural upgrades uh, to make sure that we enhance student and staff safety in those They've invited buildings. me to come so, down and jump multiple yeah, times. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Uh, a couple of significant projects. We do have the uh, architects and engineers engaged right now on the Hellgate project, which will be a very complex secondary project. Uh, we're uh, working with the teams and uh, have done a couple of charrettes with uh, staff and community, and those designs are in development. Uh, we have put out some projects for bid, and uh, we, for example, just approved the bid to re-roof a major portion of Big Sky High School. And... Uh, the winning bid uh, was a local roofing contracting company, and it came in at $761,000, which actually was nearly $100,000 less than we had anticipated in the budget. Cool. One of the things that's been really nice with these projects, uh, we've been able to accelerate many uh, in terms of our timeline, and part of that's assessing our capacity to tolerate work as well as the local contractor's ability and capacity to do work. I like that. I would have used that line. Sorry, honey, I'm out of capacity to tolerate there, work <laughs> today. It works for there me. There will be no weeds pulled <laughs> in the front yard. Yeah, so at any rate, um, because we've been able to accelerate some of those, we had built into our uh, budgets anticipated inflation and escalation of costs, and we've been able to save some significant dollars by getting those 13 projects underway now. Uh, many of them, again, are uh, through the design development, and this summer uh, you'll see a lot of construction underway. It's going to be an exciting time. We have many of the documents and designs posted on our website, so people can visit that to a see where of, we are. A lot of local employment. Uh, again, I don't remember the exact figures. The last time I looked, uh, we had 31 professional uh, service providers identified, 26 of them were Missoula That's great. firms. So, That's yeah, awesome. We're excited to roll those dollars over in the local community. All right, good deal. We're up against a break. Go ahead, John. Oh, well, when, when we get back, uh, if anyone's listened to this show before, I'm fairly skeptical about the city's water condemnation attempt. I don't know if they've thought everything out. One of the things I'm very um, one, curious about is whether or not the city has spoken with the uh, leaders of the school districts on how they'll replace the loss of funds because property taxes, Mountain Water currently pays, won't be there anymore. A lot of that goes towards the schools. And I guess I was wondering whether or not the city has uh, promised to backfill any money that might be taken out of the system after that event occurs, okay, if it go, does. We're going to come right back, 721-1290. All three lines open. Uh, we're going to talk with Mark Thane, superintendent of School District 1. We'll be right back. Okay, we're back on Talk Back, and, of course, we're start talking with Superintendent Mark Thane uh, from School District 1. So, go ahead. So, yeah, i um, just curious. Um, are th Have there been talks between the Missoula Public Schools and the City of Missoula on what would happen to the tax money that's normally uh, funneled through property taxes into the school district that won't be there if the city wins its condemnation suit and takes over? Uh, I wouldn't describe them as talks. There have been inquiries uh, at this point in time, and as you've indicated, if— uh, and, of course, the Supreme Court's hearing the Mountain Water case uh, tomorrow yeah. on the U of M well, they're, case they're campus. Hearing, they're hearing one question. What? The one case, of the yeah. questions, yeah. yeah. At any rate, uh, the uh, question about changing tax base, um, the impacts uh, certainly would be felt in the Missoula community. But uh, the way our levies work, uh, and using the bond levy as a prime example, the voters gave us authority to levy the mills necessary to generate $158 million for our construction projects. The number of mills levied are determined based on the uh, tax base as it exists in Missoula and uh, the number of dollars that we need to generate. So if Mountain Water were to go off the tax rolls, uh, we still have a debt service obligation that's predetermined based on the uh, bond that was passed, uh, generating a certain number of dollars, and the number of mills that would be necessary in order to uh, pay that debt service would be levied in the community. So whoa, we wouldn't whoa, have whoa, a whoa, specific whoa. Okay. Uh, effect <laughs> just simply on mountain water. We would yeah. not necessarily lose revenue. So what I hear, forgive me, what no, I hear you problem. saying is if, if uh, mountain water belongs to the city and that money's not coming in from them, it's going to be spread out through the rest of the tax base to make that up. Uh, in essence, that's my understanding. I would say this, too, though. Uh, there are presently a, 
according to one local uh, engineering firm, about $600 million worth of construction projects on the docket in Missoula. Our tax base changes every year. And uh, over the life, 20 year life of these bonds, our tax base will change each and every year. Uh, presumably, it'll go up. There continues to be development. So the tax impact on the public will vary each and every year. Certainly, Mountain Water's a significant taxpayer in the community, and we recognize that that would have an effect. Um, you know, and there do need to be discussions about how we mitigate that uh, to the degree possible uh, as part of the mountain water discussion. Um, the point, I think, from my perspective being it's not going to bankrupt the school district at this point. We're not going to have to default on something <laughs> as a result of losing access to that tax base. So uh, it's still an interesting question. It's still an important question because of uh, its implications, you know, for the community in terms of taxes. Now, you were telling us something, so that I guess the school district is working on trying to integrate arts into the classroom? Yes, uh, we actually are in the third year of a three-year grant with the Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts, and it has had some local publicity, but maybe not to the degree that uh, we would like to see it publicized. Uh, we're looking at art really from three different perspectives. Uh, Arts exposure. So, for example, uh, we bus all our fourth grade students annually to hear the Missoula Symphony, and it's just exposure to the arts that uh, each and every student might not normally get through his or her family. Every student? All fourth graders. Oh, fourth graders. Yes. Then, uh, in addition to exposure to the arts, uh, there's kind of the arts for art's sake. So it's our opportunity to enhance our music, our visual arts, our performing arts instruction through uh, dedication of some district resources to do now, that. Now, for instance, w was part of that when the when the ballet symposium was here, were, th were there kids uh, going out of school to see that? Or was, it, was that I, part of this? Or Yes, and there are a number of those exposure activities that uh, we've conducted and some at various different grade levels. But I think the most important part of it is uh, we're in the middle of a concerted effort to provide training to all of our teachers to help them understand how to utilize art as a modality to teach content in the regular core areas. So the example I would cite, um, through the Creative Pulse program at the university, uh, I observed a lesson where teachers were being taught how to teach uh, some science concepts, the anatomy of a tree, through movement and song, and watching them implement that. and. Uh, it was amazing the recall the students had of those critical elements. Go ahead and just do it yeah, for I'll, us. I'll, 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 I'll it here, and uh, <laughs> it's a good thing it's radio. I'll, and not, I'll describe. Uh, I'll describe to the listeners yeah. what you're doing. <laughs> so, and and again, I observed out in one of our elementary schools, uh, a third grade I am class. A yeah, there you go. <laughs> A third grade class learning about uh, money and about place value, uh, utilizing movement education. And uh, it's a great concept. And I tell you what, a uh, number of students that respond to that modality is really impressive. It's just yet another way of giving instructional input and for students that have strengths in those areas to then master core content. If you, if you want to find out what, how quick and how comprehensive a young person's mind really is, okay, uh, I will bet that there's probably 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th graders that can recite every single word to their favorite, not song, but their favorite album. I, they, they've got it. They've got, got it all right here. Do they have albums? Well, well, you know, CD, uh, whatever you know, it might the be. The big record, yeah. plastic. No, it's no. Oh. <laughs> Get out of here. Vinyl, vinyl. Yeah. But, but you know what I mean. Yeah. No, exactly true. Yeah. And uh, you know, I think it's uh, instructive for us. And I think that we need to be uh, again nimble and creative in terms of how we help students relate to the content and engage with the content. And their this favorite is yet MP3. another opportunity. So uh, <laughs> students uh, are out of school on Monday. It's a PIR day, which stands for uh, pupil instruction related, and we'll be doing professional development activities with staff. And uh, as part of our ongoing training cycle, we'll have another uh, couple elementary school staffs going through that training for the Kennedy Center on arts integration. And we're really excited about the prospects. And it's been a great boon, I think, to our educational program. So if, if I'm if I'm an instructor doing this, I don't have to wear yoga pants or anything we're doing. We'd prefer you don't. <laughs> Uh, you specifically. Okay. Uh, no, uh, you don't. Uh, but again, uh, we, I think, find that uh, there are a lot of kids that have aptitude in uh, the arts or in music and uh, just anything we can do to help them utilize those relative strengths to master curriculum content. I was, I was curious about that, that level of aptitude. One of the things that um, I struggle with as a, a parent is watching a child... Uh, do really well in a subject, but kind of cap out because of the class. 
Um, is that something that, that, I mean, do you have ways to integrate uh, the higher level bracket? You know, like we were talking about the test, right? If you're scoring well on the test, you get harder questions. You get challenged a little bit more. Um, but, but, you know, for, for, for two of my kids on two different subjects, you know, they've basically mastered the level of, of education that they're getting at, at this point. And it's only April. Yeah. Right. And so it's kind of like, well, maybe they, they should be pushed a bit harder. I mean, of course, they try to push sure them at should. home. But yeah. is, there, is there something out there to try? And we've talked to the teacher, and, you know, there's just not enough teachers really to take the kids to another class to... Well, hang on to that answer. we go one minute time out. Right. I'm sorry to be the commercial sheriff. Well, we're gonna, we, all three lines open still. Uh, Mark Thane joining us, the superintendent of School District 1. you got a question. Only a few minutes left. We'll be right back. Okay, we're back on Talk Back. 721-1290 is our number. Uh, Mark Thane joining us here this morning is superintendent of School District 1, and we have Mark... For Mark. Good morning, Mark. <laughs> Mark, Good morning. Words. What, Good morning. What, what's on your mind, sir? Uh, you need to utilize uh, your musical uh, big red band in a more positive way because they have been, for 22 years plus, whenever they play at the Grizz game, right. they've never lost. So we got to set them up when we have a tough opponent. <laughs> Yeah, like both in Eastern Washington. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that. I think we better have some conversations with Travis Tecure and Robin Selvig and see how we can uh, do that. Okay, great. Thanks yeah. for finally putting one and one together, and no one really caught that before. Yeah, yeah, no, that's uh, that's interesting, and I know that at the time Red Waves appear at those games, uh, we get a lot of parents associated with them uh, attending the games too. And how come I we think don't have them during changes football? Changes the dynamic. How come we don't have them during football season? Uh, you know, you're the one who probably needs to deal with that as the stadium announcer. <laughs> Get that figured out, <laughs> Peter. All right, thanks for your call, Mark. thanks, Mark. That's a that's a really that's a very cool deal. So yeah. uh, I'll give you my quick story. Uh, uh, my my daughter, uh, high level reader in her class. I don't know if she's great everywhere, but she's at least good at her class. And she's kind of capped out the, the reading level. We were talking with her teacher. And uh, for a while, there was a student teacher from the university that was taking her and two or three other kids to go into a, a special uh, class where they would do some more advanced language arts stuff, right? Um, and it was really great for her and of uh, you know pushing her boundaries a little bit more. But now that the, the girl is, I uh, understand, gone or to another class, that... That, that avenue is gone. And so she's kind of back to just doing the basic, you know, capped out every day sort of education. And you were talking earlier about kids just being sitting in a chair for a certain amount of time to get a, a degree or to get their uh, diploma and that not being maybe the wisest way to deal with things. I was wondering, are we pushing ourselves in Missoula to try to make sure that every kid is engaged, um, even if that class is behind them? You know, I appreciate the question because uh, one of the things that we've taken on as a significant project in our district is something that we reference as PLCs, and it stands for Professional Learning Community. And again, we're working with our staff in a couple of different ways. Number one, to provide professional development for them to understand how they can continue to be professional learners and continue to hone their craft and do that study. We also... um, for example, at a Cold Spring school where you might have four second grades, the professional learning community's concept would be that each week we would identify time for those four teachers to come together to talk about uh, what their priority goals and objectives are for the week, how they're going to teach them, and how maybe they could flexibly group the students so that they can meet all learners' needs. There are four fundamental questions that teachers are asked to address uh, through the professional learning communities model. The first is, what should students know and be able to do? Second is, how are we going to assess to know whether or not they've mastered that content that we purport to teach? The third question is, what are we going to do for those students who don't show mastery of that content as we get to the end of a unit or the end of a week of instruction? And the fourth one is, what are we going to do for those students who either master it quickly or who already know the content before you even start teaching it? So uh, the example you cite with reading, one of the things that we would uh, propose is certainly there are some basic language arts skills that might be associated with a large group instruction. But you should also then be able to take the students and to identify groups that have like needs and maybe use a reading workshop approach where different students are interacting with different materials that are appropriate at their level. Um, It takes a lot of work balancing and facilitating those groups. So whether you approach it within your classroom with those groupings or whether you as a grade level team of four teachers develop a walk to read uh, methodology where maybe students with certain uh, skill deficits and needs might be with one teacher's 
one teacher, students with other needs might be with a second teacher, students with more advanced needs might be with the third teacher during that reading instructional period. And again, we're working to implement the program. We're trying to uh, be thoughtful about how we teach the teachers about the instructional models that we would want to employ. But that's where we're going with when professional are you, learning. When are you hoping to integrate it? Uh, we're working on it right now. It's at various stages of implementation across the district. But, uh, you know, I'd say right now with the elementaries and middle schools, we've made significant inroads. We're certainly working on that at the high school level, too. Uh, we certainly have a lot of work to be done in that area, but I do think it's important that we understand what we need to do to meet the learning needs of each and every student. We have two minutes left. Uh, some, some important things you want, our we have a bunch of people listening to this show every day. So if, if, are there some specific concrete things you want them to know about what the school district is doing and how perhaps they can help you? Uh, there are a couple of things I'd cite right away. First of all, we're engaged right now with kindergarten registration. And if you have a student or a child who will be five years old on or before September 10th. Uh, we'd love to get them registered now. We would also encourage you, if you have friends or neighbors that have students in that age range, they should get them registered. We're working to identify what staffing needs we have at each building, and until we have those numbers, uh, that's difficult for us. We also are uh, well aware that students come in with a variety of experiences when they approach uh, kindergarten. So registering early allows us to uh, communicate with parents through kindergarten roundup what activities and uh, things they might want to engage in over the next few months so that their child will be prepared and ready to enter a kindergarten classroom. So that's a big one for us. And again, uh, just a general statement, uh, we as a district are really intent on being responsive to the community. Uh, we want to be a partner with uh, each and every family in order to work for uh, achievement of students' potential. And uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to have dialogue with community in this venue, but at each and every uh, opportunity. How so do we contact you. your office and website and all that? Uh, again, website is mcpsmt.org, and uh, all the contact information is located there. And as you referenced earlier, uh, school board meetings. Yeah, we just uh, we just got ballots. We just great. got ballots in the mail. You bet. Ooh. We're having an election. May A lot 3rd. of folks don't have any idea who these people are. Yeah. <laughs> so we just go on the website and read about them? You know what you should do, Mark? You should arrange for a hearing on TalkBack with all of the candidates so there people can call in. candidate forum, huh? Let's do it. And we're out of time. Thanks. Thank you. You're gone tomorrow. I'm gone. What we are going to try to do is we're going to try to simulcast the uh, Supreme Court hearing tomorrow on TalkBack from 9 to 10. We'll try. We'll see what happens.